This morning we start another series. I, I think series are the way to go during these times. You want to focus on a particular idea, at least in my mind, that will help us through these days. Some regard these days as, as dark days, certainly unpredictable days. Days when we sometimes think, where is the hope and where is the solace and where is the comfort? Days that we sometimes wonder, Lord, are you there with us? And like you promise, are you really always there? Have you forsaken us? And so we start this series I have entitled, Walking with God in Changing Times. And we're going to look at the life of Abraham. In the beginning, his name was Abram. We're going to make the point. We're going to make it such that we understand that even during changes, God has a way of working through us. God has a way of making sure that we understand that God is there. And that God is not frightened or God is not scared because of these changes. So we build our houses on the rock, not on the sand. We build our houses on a firm foundation, which is in Jesus Christ. Amen. I think it was Bob Dylan. I looked it up, actually. I know it was Bob Dylan. In 1964, he penned and sung the song, the times, they are changing. And I went back to that song and I wanted to read again some of the words of the lyrics. And I came up with the first uh, stanza or the first verse and I'd like to read it for you. It says, come gather round people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if your time if your time to you is worth saving and you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. Do we have any doubts? Do we have any doubts as we sit here in our sanctuary and as we sit at home, do we have any doubts? that we're living in changing times? Do we have to wonder? Do we have to guess? Do we have to listen to the voices that tell us that things are happening? Do we really need that or do we sense that the times there are changing? It was the Greek philosopher Heraclitus who said, change is the only constant in life. We want life to be consistent and predictable, and yet the only thing consistent and predictable is change. And so we need to be in the mindset, we need to understand that even as we face this global pandemic, that there's something here that we need to connect with. There's something about this experience that should not go by lightly. It should be examined like a doctor examines his or her patient. It should be looked at. It should be, it should be contemplated. It should be discussed. It should be talked about. The times, they're changing. When I last checked, there were 5,000 and uh, 570,000, rather, cases of COVID-19 in Florida. So far, over 9,000 people have died in Florida alone. Last time I checked, in the U.S., there were over 5 million, almost 5.5 5 million cases of the COVID and close to 170,000 deaths in America. In the world, there were over 21 million cases of the COVID and over 7,050, 7,500 dead. This global pandemic has forever changed the way we live, will forever change the way we view ourselves and each other. 
and many have suggested that the changes are coming so swiftly that it's, it's hard for many of us to adjust. And many of us hit back and we, and we hit out and we, and we do not know how to cope with this. The times there are changing, but I'm here to tell you, my friends, that when you walk with God in these changing times, that God has a way. God has a way. And don't be alarmed. Don't be distressed. Don't be discouraged. Don't be frustrated. Don't act crazy. Because our God is still in charge, even though the times there are changing. Amen? The scientists tell us that when we start looking now at the urban areas and many of the areas, the socioeconomics are showing us up in these pandemic times. We're seeing disparities that we didn't see before or we suspected were there before, but now these are becoming blatant. There are certain people who are more privileged than others. The times, they're changing and we're getting more aware, amen. The pandemic, the pandemic is upending healthcare in the United States as we knew it. And this could, could result sooner or later. It's coming. Wait for it. It's coming sooner or later. You will not need to go into your doctor's office anymore. You'll be examined on video from home. Sooner or later, the personal touch might not be there the way we want it to be there. I'm not, I'm not saying it's going to be expensive. I'm not saying everybody's going to have to be video inspected. I'm simply saying the technology is now trying to keep up even with health care. Those of us who are in education, our teachers, college professors, we now know what remote learning is all about and remote teaching. The times, they're a changing. The times, they're a changing. And there's changing in our human behavior. I have this theory of mine, I'm still working it through, it's just a theory. I think now we're either getting nastier with each other or kinder. You see, if you're nasty at the core, COVID, or as we say in some parts of the world, Rona, is going to show us up. If your core person is nasty, Rona, Corona, is going to show you up for who you are. If your core person is kind and gentle and graceful, then Rona is going to show you to be kind and gentle and graceful. The people of God say amen. Because there are some mental health issues also to be addressed in these times that are changing. The question is, will we continue walking with God even when times are changing? Or will we be tempted to make an excuse that, well, we can no longer worship, we can no longer serve, we can no longer do Bible study, because God understands that Corona is upon us. No, I don't think that's the deal. The deal in place, as we shall see in Abraham's life, is not that when there are changes and challenges, we back off from God. In fact, when there are changes and challenges, we engage God. We say, God, where are you? Now is your time. Let me stand back and see you work your wonderful miracles. When there are times of difficulties and times of challenges and times that are changing, that's when God shows up. That's when God presents God's awesome, majestic self. How majestic, Lord, is your name in all the earth. And so the miracle cures and the so-called prophets of doom cannot withstand the awesome grace and the awesome deliverance of a sovereign God. And Abraham found that out. In the times that were changing, Abraham had to come to grips with that. And so one of the lessons from Genesis chapter 12 as we look at the passage 
is that when times are changing, there are a couple of fundamental questions that we ask ourselves. And I like what Abraham is about. I like the passage because I glean from the passage. The first point I'd like to point out is, I'd like to give is that because the times are changing, I need to ask the question, who am I? Who am I? I need to get to the bottom of it. I need to identify me. I need to understand my own identity. In times of change, in times of challenges, in times of difficulties, it is not for you to run, blame somebody else. The first thing we need to do is to check ourselves. Who am I? Who am I? What is my identity? as I go through these times of change, because that's gonna make a fundamental difference in how I approach the changes. It's gonna make a fundamental difference in how I deal with the challenges. It's gonna make a fundamental difference in how I accept God's will and God's way while we are going through the coronavirus. The times there are changing, but the first thing I need to do when I look at myself and I look at the difficulties is to ask myself, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? What is my identity? And so we go to the passage in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, if we might get there. The Lord said to Abram, Abraham, not Abraham, that was later on. Now he is Abraham, that was his original name. It means exalted father. Abraham, the Lord said to the exalted father, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Abraham, go, Abraham, go. Go and do what I bid you to do. Don't be looking at the circumstances. Don't be looking at the changes and say, oh my God, how are we going to do this? First thing you do is check who you are. You are Abraham, the exalted father. And because of that, I'm sending you somewhere. I'm asking you to do something. And your life is about to change. You're going through the changes and the times they are a changing. I was intrigued when I looked at the naming of babies in many cultures. Do you know that in Germany, there's a list of approved names you gotta check before you name your baby? And let me tell you why. They tell me that you don't get to choose just any old name. You don't get to choose, for example, and this is what they're concerned about. You don't get to choose a name that violate the rights of the child. You don't get to choose a name that is offensive or ridiculous. You know how some of us get. We get a name on a child and God knows where we got that name from. And the child grows up having to bear that name. We not the ones bearing some of these stupid names. It's the child. And so in Germany and in some parts of the world, you don't get to pick and choose any name you want to pick and choose. The society protects the child in the naming. Work with me, folks. Work with me. The name must also indicate the child's gender. You can't just make this generic. You, you can't just say, oh, whatever you want it to be. You got to recognize that in the child's mind as the child grows up, the child needs to know who they are. And so you name based on that. You limit the child's name to no more than five. And you don't do any unconventional spelling. In Africa, the naming of children reflect the hopes of the parents. Watch this. The hopes of the parents. Who am I? I am the hope of my parents. I'm the hope of my generation. The parents believe that a child's name can influence the child for life. It's a life sentence. 
You name a name, I don't want to bring up any because I don't want to disrespect any in our broader audience, but you name folks certain names, and that's like a death sentence. You got to be careful. You got to be careful that that name represents the values of the community, the values of the parents, and you bring, you bear upon the child the name that will take them through life with success and for success. Some parents do that, some parents don't. Pastor Paul, what's your point? My point is this. You start identifying who you are, and that's going to determine how you make it through changes. You give me any old name, you name me whatever you want to name me. You label me whatever you want to label me. And you put in my mind an idea of who I am supposed to be. And by golly, how am I going to get through these changes? How am I going to get through these difficulties if my name is an insult? If my label that you placed upon me is an insult? How am I going to get through COVID-19? And so Abraham, exalted father, and with a name like that, the sky is the limit. Exalted Father, test your own name and your own self-designation. How do you view yourself? Forget name. Forget the phonetics. Forget the name itself. How do you label yourself? How do you label others? Because that's an important aspect in how we go through changing times. Exalted Father. You're reaching for the stars. You're inspiring. So don't go dropping a name on me that is going to limit me. Don't go calling me out of my name that's going to limit me and make you feel good or your entities feel good. Don't do that because there's the, going to be the pushback. If I'm sensible and if I'm understanding how my identity is wrapped up in my survival, then don't give me no names that I will have to push back on because I will. Exalted Father. Acts chapter 17 verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our beings as some of our own poets have said, we are God's offspring. The image of God is in every one of us. So don't go giving folks names that you have no business doing. Keep it within yourself. Don't even go to your little meetings and your little click groups and try to find something, try to say something and label something and call some people by their names or out of their name. Don't you do it because you will have to face Almighty God at some point. The church say amen. Because if you give me a name that's not mine, how am I going to make it through these times? It's important. Who am I? Abraham knew who he was. His parents gave him that name for a reason. When you start encouraging people, when you start encouraging the young folk, when we start uh, uh, continue to encourage the young spirits like we do, Believe me, that's helpful. That's going to do a whole lot when they have to confront the nastiness of society. We acknowledge, we lift them up because how we call them, how we name them, how we brand them is important to their own survival. Now here's the deal, here's the deal. Many of us walk around not knowing who we are. Let's lay it out there. And usually these are the people who are causing problems. We don't know who we are. We're not sure yet. We're waiting for somebody else to tell us who we are. We're not sure yet. So in the meantime, we meddle and we make trouble. And we don't, know, we don't have a clue as to how to go through changing times. Find yourself. Find yourself. Anchor yourself in some bigger concept like the image of God in you. 
That makes a big difference. And many of us struggle with this idea of anonymity. In other words, people don't know me, so let me show myself. People don't know me enough, let me show off myself. If you have to get there, it means you have not yet defined who you are. And you're afraid of not being known? Don't worry about that. You be what God wants you to be, and you'll be known. I guarantee you, you will be known. And it's not about getting known, it's about making sure that whatever agenda God has for you, that you will be fulfilling that agenda. You gotta Google this with me, because maybe I'm wrong. There was a couple in the UK who actually named their baby Lucifer. And they went to the courts and they won. Now, Google it just in case I'm lying. I don't hear Pastor lied last Sunday. Google it. I forget their names, but Lucifer. Now, I was thinking about that. Now, me, I wouldn't name my son Lucifer because, you know, the implications. Lucifer is Satan or eventually became Satan. But remember who Lucifer was. Lucifer means bright shining star or morning star. You see, sometimes we get named the right way. Oh, I'm being videotaped here too. Sometimes I get named the right way, but somebody else changes it or our actions and behavior changes who we are. So you may have received a good name, a good name. But because of your attitude and your actions and your behavior, because of how mean you are to people, how nasty you are to people, because of how you have, you have treated people on the work, on, on, on the work job or on, in the workplace, because you are boss and you decide what is what, because you have decided to put people down, now your name is in jeopardy. Now Lucifer becomes Satan. The character of bright and light has become darkness. You all getting this? Naming is very important and you, your fulfillment of that name and many of us are proud of our last names for example. Many of us will fight and defend our last name. We're from a proud generation. Good for you. But I know many of us are still reeling from the fact that many of our forefathers didn't do the right thing. And so we're changing. We're making sure that our identity will not match what happened back in the day. The times there are changing. Abraham knew that. Now he had to leave. He had to go. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking about last year, July, when we came here from Chicago. And the packing and the unpacking and the truck and the, oh my God, they, 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 you know, they left something back there and, and we couldn't find this. There were boxes, there are still boxes un, unopened. We don't know where, what is some, sometimes. Can you imagine Abraham? Times for him were changing. But Abraham knew who he was. Did you all get that? Abraham knew who he was. He was exalted father. We would say in my country, you would big up Abraham. Much respect to Abraham. The impact on one's sense of self in terms of who you are cannot be even understood normally. We are sometimes unconsciously unaware that we are feeding into an agenda, a journey that was not God's in the first place because we chose not to recognize the image of God within us and therefore to allow our identities to emerge from such an image that God has placed within us. If you have any doubt whatsoever, go back 
to the Spirit of God in you. If you have any doubt whatsoever what you should be doing and where you should be going and whatever changes there are, you go back to the image of God in you. If you have any doubt whatsoever as to how to regard the next person, you got to see the image of God in them. Who am I? Who am I? Secondly, not only did Abraham recognize his identity in these changing times, but he also recognized his purpose. His purpose. Out of your identity comes your purpose. Where, why am I here? <laughs> why am I here? Why are you here, Sister Barbara? You don't have to answer. <laughs> why are we here? And why are we here in the broader sense of, of the world and uh, uh, world affairs? Why are we here? What role do we play? Look at verse 2. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will watch this make your name great for Abraham that 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 was like cream on the top it was like gravy on the biscuit I will make your name even greater should have been the translation and eventually Abraham would become Abraham, the father of many nations. The exalted father would become the father of many nations. But what's the purpose? Why are we here? What has God called you to do? Unless we know who we are, we won't be able to determine our purpose. In fact, I do believe that the purpose we adopt is in line with how we view ourselves. You see people walking around sometimes doing stuff. Don't worry. Don't, don't be baffled. Whatever they're doing is in line with how they view themselves. It's straight out. Straight out of my identity comes my purpose. You all with me? Straight out of who I, how I answer the question, who am I, comes the question, why am I here? But what if God does not view you the same way you view yourself? Then the purpose you have in mind for yourself is not God's purpose for you. Let's get the verse up there that says Abraham was 75 years old. Let's start there. My friends, your purpose in life is not fulfilled until God's breath is no longer in your body. Do you know that? Purpose is not about, it's not measured by how much money you've accumulated. It's not measured by whether or not the man on the job site say, now you retire. That's not the purpose and that's not how you measure one's purpose. Your occupation has an expiration date, not your purpose. And I'll explain that to you. Well, Pastor Paul, when I die, what's my purpose? Hello, you didn't read the verses. Abraham would die, sure. But what did God say? I will make you nations. And the nations that are after you are part of your purpose. So even after I'm dead and gone and there's, there's a memorial service or if my body is in the casket... My purpose is still ongoing. Why? Because my name has allowed me to touch lives. You all with me on this one? So it's not just who am I, but why am I here? I'm here to make sure that God's will is fulfilled in others' lives. You are declared, or you declare yourself retired, but don't get it twisted. Your purpose stays with you until death and beyond. 
we can think of people, can't we, who have left a legacy behind. One of the names I hear of in this church a lot is our sister Martha Law. Amen? Amen? Maybe I can use our sister Martha as an example. So our sister is no longer with us, but her legacy stays. So my purpose does not expire based on time. Because there's more to be achieved in the generations that we will touch. We touch the lives of our young people. We touch the lives of each other. And we are expanding our purpose. Our purpose is fulfilled in how we connect with each other and how we connect with people. Like Abraham, our purpose is to promote life and extend God's grace into future generations. Hallelujah. In other words, as a result of our, our lives, as a result of who we are, Others, both here and now, and there and then, will be blessed and highly favored. I love that thought. I love that thought, that even after I'm dead and gone, oh yeah, there are going to be people who are going to say, well, good riddance. I ain't, I ain't, I'm, not, I'm not a jackass, I know that. There are people who say, oh, he's gone, thank God, let's, let's get another pastor. I know it, don't, don't even say nothing, I know it. And they'd say the same about you, so don't act like you're all, all friendly to everybody. Some people are going to say, I oh, mean, I'm glad she's gone. <laughs> well, I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> Let me be gender equal, he or she, right? <laughs> Not you, Brother Phil, everybody's going to just... <laughs> But each life we touch, y'all with me now, I can, I can tell, y'all with me. Each life we touch will be better because we have contributed to her, we have contributed to him. I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. How does the name Paul get great? By touching lives. By touching lives. Those of you who are teachers, you know how that feels. 20 years after teaching, somebody stops you on the street and say, are you, are you such and such? You say, yeah. They say, you don't remember me, but you had an effect on me. <laughs> you had an effect on me. You don't remember because you've had so many students. Or you don't remember because you have, you have encountered so many people. And you hope by the grace of God that you touch somebody's life because you understood your purpose. Who am I? Why am I here? In closing, I could go on for like two days on this one. <laughs> Y'all see me trying to discipline myself. You're not even praying for me up here. <laughs> Thank you. Let me leave you with a thought about naming. Sometimes we have to rename ourselves. You know, like companies do. There, there are some companies who rebrand themselves. They go through this analysis and say, you know what? We're not getting the customers. <laughs> Something is wrong. Maybe it's the logo. We need to twist that a little. Maybe that will brighten things up a little. Sometimes we need to rename ourselves. Sometimes we don't need to carry around legacies that were thrusted upon us that we had nothing to do with. Sometimes we just have to say, you know what, I'm going to rebrand myself from here on out. Today is the first day in the rest of my life and I have control with my God in what I do. A kind of rebranding. Sometimes it means that you associate less with some people. Because they're not good for you. And you know it. See, it's one thing if you didn't, oh, Pastor Paul, I don't know. You know, they pray, you know, they go to Bible study. You know, we do this. Come on now, you know. As you grow, as you rebrand, as you rename, 
your so-called friends and associates will change. That's a natural consequence. So when you keep calling people and they're not answering, or you keep texting and they're not responding, leave it alone. You're on your way to the promised land if you didn't do them something wrong. It's just that they can't roll with your purpose no more. Because you've rebranded yourself. Amen? These things happen. I don't know if I believe in this thing called friend for life. I don't know if I believe in it. Well, Pastor Paul, you're, you're a sad case then. I, I don't know. Maybe we can sit and talk about it. Because when I want to excel, when I want just not to be a, an exalted father, an exalted man, an exalted brother in the Lord, and I want to be a father of many nations, I want to do good works and a lot of work, and you're standing in my way, we ain't going to be friends no more. That's plain and simple. I'm not going to drag you along anymore. And if I'm in the position where I'm holding you back from achieving your goals and achieving what you want to achieve, then lay me aside. The book of Hebrews said that. It said, lay aside all the sins and the stuff that hold us back. A lot of us want to be Christians, but, but we carrying along. We pulling some chains and, 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 and so on along. Let it go. Let it go. Do not give, finally, do not give everyone permission to speak into your life. Who am I that God would choose me? Who are you that God would choose you for a purpose? Thank you.